Last night, I had a dream. There was a girl. I got this kind of gift. And you are? Sandy. I can see people, places. So I'll see you again. You know where to find me. But they're not just dreams. They really happened. What did you see? A girl murdered. You witnessed the murder last night. You believe this was a vision. Jack, I don't want to do this. You think you can just walk away? Do you believe in ghosts? Say it yourself. We're going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store. Back where it says horror videos and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing inquiring minds want to know? I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick encrustations dying on the surface. But the prime time gets. Pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. We've got to return some video. Hello, horror hounds, and we are here. I am Rowan, and I'm Colden. I always, uh, I always feel awkward. I always feel like I want to. Give it, like, some sort of different introduction. Yeah, for the Movie House Horror Reviews. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're here. Movie House Horror Review. I, I feel like if you've clicked it, you probably already know what's going on. Uh, you've read the title. That's right. Last Night in Soho, 2021, directed by Edgar Wright. Wright. Oh, yeah. Never have I been so excited for a film since Baby Driver. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can see it behind me on camera, but I actually have a Baby Driver poster right oh, here. Beautiful. So that's... uh. I don't know. I feel like a lot of people in recent years aren't as kind the baby driver as when it first came out. I mean, maybe it's the Kevin Spacey stuff, but uh, I, I, I'm still a huge fan of baby driver. So, yeah, this is one of my most anticipated of the year for sure. Let's just let's get into it. Colton, why don't you give us the get bio and then we'll yeah. uh, spoil the shit out of it. <laughs> Sure thing. Uh, So Last Night in Soho, as uh, Rowan already said, uh, written, directed by uh, Edgar Wright. Uh, It's about a young girl passionate about fashion design is mysteriously able to enter the 1960s where she encounters her idol, a dazzling wannabe singer. But 1960s London is not what it seems, and time seems to be falling apart with shady consequences. (laughs) Just a reminder to follow us on all of our social media at It Slays Podcast. We're on Twitter. Facebook, Instagram, soon to be on Tumblr. Uh, of course, we're on Spotify and iTunes. And if you're adding us on iTunes, don't forget to leave us an iTunes review. Uh, it doesn't even need to be five star. We appreciate five star. But uh, the most important part is we want to hear from you. So uh, write us a uh, text review in the iTunes app and we will make sure to give you a shout out on the podcast uh every review helps as it bumps us up in the search engine and you know that's what it's all about back to the podcast so yeah it's a bit of a gender bender gender bender genre bender Um, (laughs) and it's uh it's kind of like a little bit of like the glitz and glamour of like a, a regular like hollywood movie uh from that time but also with uh some psychological horror in there i guess and straight up horror i guess by the third act you know yeah i was gonna say uh this is definitely uh definitely giallo inspired far more than yeah, like uh our malignant term 
Oh, God. I was super excited about this because obviously I knew once I saw the trailer and I'd seen some of the interviews with Edgar Wright just talking about it and stuff. Like, I was like, all right, here we go. Like, stab number two at a New Age Jalo movie. Yeah, it seems like it's one that he's been trying to get made for a while and like he had a bunch of it kind of formed, I think, in his head. And, you know, he wanted to kind of pay homage to a, a bunch of movies and music from the 60s and. 70s i guess to some degree i kind of wonder if he had the whole story formed in his head or just certain aspects of it uh but I guess we'll get into that a little bit more later. I feel like I need to apologize straight up front. If people go back and listen to uh, our episode on The Witch, where I said there is no better made-up name I've ever heard than Thomason, and no one ever would have that name. Well, here she is. <laughs> I have been proven wrong. <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. She's great. Uh, this is this is my first uh, happening with her. I I didn't see Jojo Rabbit, so okay, I have. Yeah. What what else has she been? Do you have her like uh, credits there? Or yeah, so uh, she was in that. She was in um, a movie called Leave No Trace. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. And the True History of the Kelly Gang. Yeah, that was a TIFF premiere that. Um, my friend went to see, but I didn't go see it because it didn't have like the best buzz around it. So, so yeah, I guess I've seen her in this and, uh, Jojo Rabbit. Yeah. So I, I totally was not familiar with it. Anna to- Joy Taylor was really the only one I was familiar with. Yeah. For me, I knew like, uh, Di- Diana Riggs from like, uh, Game of Thrones. And I think she like... <laughs> You know, uh, apparently she's this famous actress that's been in everything, but I I don't really know her from anything other than Game of Thrones, I think. So she's in this with a pretty big role. And Matt Smith, I know him from like, obviously he was a doctor from Doctor Who, I think, but I I, I didn't watch Doctor Who, so I'm not very familiar with him either. (laughs) I knew he was a Doctor Who, yeah, but I also have never watched Doctor, I shouldn't say that. One time I watched like three episodes of Doctor Who and I actually really liked it. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll get into this. And then I just never did. Yeah, I had the opposite experience where I watched like a couple episodes and it was so cheesy that I was like, no, I'm never getting into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt Smith, I think he's also in that upcoming uh, Game of Thrones spinoff. I-, I feel like I've seen him in my head wearing a bad wig recently so i think i think it's in that game of thrones spinoff coming out next year yeah and i feel like i can't think of what it is i feel like he's in something else because i'm pretty sure he was in a trailer before this movie played like one of the trailers i yeah. watched so i was like I, oh i they, feel like i'm forgetting something as well yeah i was like he but they must have been like all right he's gonna he's really hitting in the next yeah, year he's having a bit of a moment i think since we're you know we're talking about people i want to say like the cast i love the cast of this uh, Terrence Stamp is all I always like when he shows up and stuff. Yeah, I, I've listened to a few different reviews on this because I, I never knew we were going to be recording a movie house horror on it because I saw this actually a week ago. And yeah, everyone loves Terrence Stamp, but he's another one of those just like he's an older actor that I'm just not very familiar with. Or I feel like I've seen his face in a shitload of things, but I wouldn't be able to like point to anything, I guess. I'm kind of the same way. Like I know I've seen like 8 million things he's been in. Yeah. Every time I see him, I'm like, oh yeah, that guy, I like that guy. And then it just kind of, mm-hmm. I probably couldn't really name them I'm unless I looked specifically for them. The only person I really wanted, I'm going to brutalize his last name, is Michael Ajo, Ajo. I don't know how to pronounce it either. I'd go like Ajo, maybe. Yeah, no. Ajo. I thought he was fantastic in this. I thought he was really good. He's really good. I I think some of the writing in the third act lets his character down a bit. I feel like, uh, I don't know, when uh, Thomason really starts losing her mind, I feel like maybe a realistic character would have behaved a little bit different. You know, when she comes out of... Uh, a classmate with a pair of uh, shears and almost stabs her in the face or after that uh, miscommunication in the bedroom like I feel like a real life character may have behaved different towards her but uh, yeah I mean his acting for what he's given is good in it he's and he's really endearing for the first probably hour of the movie for sure I think I just like the character yeah I thought it was thought it was interesting I agree that you know if I'm him after that horrifying experience and (laughs) oh with after that bedroom scene where essentially like you're not sure if you feel like uh, she, you're, you know, raping somebody, you know, or being yeah. involved in a sexual assault or like not sure what's going on. I feel like most guys would be like, oh, my God, like <laughs> kind of traumatized by it as well, you know, and kind of keep their distance for sure. So it's just a bit of a weird uh, dynamic between them from that point on in the movie, I think. I, I feel 
you know, and I always want to talk about this, but I feel like when, if you're going to talk about this film, what really to me sticks out is like the music Mm -hmm. is that this is like a, a, you know, and we got it with baby driver and all that. Like Edgar Wright is really about his soundtracks and his music. Yeah. He like frames and directs certain scenes based on music, like how he's going to edit it. So yeah, it's like integral to his films. I was going to say, I really liked it, especially like this is an air era and a kind of music like i don't listen to i i don't me neither specifically enjoy i like when i was watching this i'm like oh yeah i'm all about this like i'm i'm in the music's great it went with like all the visuals i'm seeing well we've all heard of the like the swinging 60s and like literally there's that <laughs> dance scene in the club where you know matt smith is swinging uh anya taylor joy around and then it's getting swapped with thomas and mckenzie they're doing all these like camera tricks and texas switches to get them in and out of the frame and i was like yeah this is like lively like this is this is fun. Like, it's a great scene. Like, and the music is, you know, paramount to it. I thought the music was just incredible, period. Like I said, if you can get me to care about music I don't care about, mm-hmm. that I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I even, like, caught myself where I'm like, oh, man, like, maybe I'd put this on a playlist or something. Now, realistically, yeah. when I got out, I'm like, no, nah, I would definitely not. No, you don't remember anything. But for the movie, it works. It's kind of like me when I watch, like, a Damien Chazelle movie. And I'm like, oh, maybe I do kind of like jazz, I guess, <laughs> after I sat through. It, you know, you know, I don't go put it on a playlist, but I enjoyed it while I watched it. So there's so much to unpack here. Maybe get into like our first uh, feelings of the movie or like, uh, I don't know if we should kind of go into like full on spoilers. Exactly. Like what happens? Like, I don't know. What should we do? I I say let's spoil the shit out of it. Spoil the shit out of it? If, All right. If you're listening to this, you already know we're going to spoil it because we're terrible at not doing that. So Yeah, f- for me, it's like it's a movie that I think for the first two thirds of it, when I was watching it, I was 100% on board and like literally like, oh, this is like masterful. Like I love all of this. But funny enough, we're on a horror podcast. When it starts delving into the actual horror aspects, basically when the ghosts show up, or, you know, the decomposing, rotting men show up. From then on out, the movie uh, got gradually worse and worse for me. For So I felt like it was so high for like the first hour, hour and 20 minutes, and then started to stumble a bit and go downhill but i kind of had the same feelings i didn't i didn't hate the ghost stuff Mm -hmm. and i I guess i looked at it in terms like i was like there's no way he's not paying lip service to like argento here because i mean if you're going you know in that giallo direction and then you're, you're definitely bringing in like ghosts and shit like that i mean that's like argento's bag yeah and I, I appreciate that, but I did feel the same as you, where I was just kind of like, it, there was just something about it that it was, it, it just seemed almost like rushed, and it, it, it was kind of like this film, like, I was loving the pacing, I was loving what was going on, and then they were just like, oh shit, like, we're kind of on a time crunch here. Yeah, it, it's so weird, because I feel like so much of the movie, and this is kind of what I was referencing before, where I feel like so much of the movie was like a fully formed idea, and like, how like artfully he transitions from like modern times back to the 60s you know like when she's going in the bed or like how she's excited to go to sleep in the beginning of the movie to get back to the 60s and kind of experience that and then kind of like fearing for it by the end i thought that that was all handled so well so when you put these like sometimes cgi ghosts set to like i don't know a 60 percent opacity on photoshop or some shit and then the last like 20 minutes or of the movie basically devolves into uh thomas and mckenzie just running around london you know running out of her apartment running through the library running through the streets into the alleyway it was just like man this movie took a really hard turn that i i just didn't see coming like i thought it would be a little bit more subtle or <laughs> like near the end i mean the last like five minutes or ten minutes of this movie is like pretty uh batty. Like it's it goes all out <laughs> to like I was a hundred percent not on board with like the ending stuff. But uh yeah, I don't know. I feel like there was just a better way to do the ghosts. Like when I was watching it, there's a couple of moments where they use actual actors standing in the room and they're like, you know, naked and with like their faces obscured. And I was kinda like, when that was used, that reminded me of like it follows, like of the apparition following and it was actually like a physical effect now go back to it follows and imagine if it was a cgi person set the 60 (laughs) percent opacity like the movie loses like lose would lose me at that point where 
this movie they were, there was a couple of instances where they used actors and it was good and it, like it looked better so i was like why didn't you just use people like the entire time i don't get it like he had the budget for it i'm sure that kind of confused me and i was kind of like especially with i get you know i get how the you know i guess in better terms you know the johns yeah were used as this kind of like twist where oh, they're actually not, you know, these scary ghosts. They're, like, actually, like, trying to kind of help or ask for help. I just I just thought it was really weird because I guess I was reflecting and, you know, I was trying to think about, like, all right, like, in, in our world of 2021, mm-hmm. and I was just kind of, like, I thought it was a really weird twist that, like, all of a sudden these guys are kind of, like, sympathetic characters and good it was weird because they're they're portrayed as sympathetic to some degree but also there's an element of like i'm not sure if i missed something and i really don't want to get canceled for like speaking out a turn on this but like so maybe i missed something you can correct me if i did but it was also weird that i forget the woman's name it's who anya taylor joy is playing in the 60s what's the character name do you know off the top of your head Oh, Sandy. Sandy. Uh, It was weird that, like, obviously Sandy wanted to be a singer and an actress and all these things and wound up getting into prostitution, like, in the 60s. So it was a weird, like, twist at the end of the movie where she's actually been murdering hundreds of men and hiding them in the floorboards and shit that I was like, I was like, oh my god, like, I was completely on board with you, but then I'm kind of like, like, okay, if a man, like, uses sex work, does it, like, should he be murdered for that? And then I was like, okay, wait, are we viewing them as, like, sexual like were they assaulting her and it was just it got very confused in the last like 10 minutes of the movie which i wasn't 100 percent sure what the movie was trying to say like because you were mentioning like the help me scene i assume with the with the dudes (laughs) yeah i which i i just i really don't know what he was trying to say it gets very muddled there yeah well and i think that was kind of the issue for me was that i was like i feel like maybe edgar didn't know what he was real like really saying or if he was really trying to say anything just because like to me it was like we spent these this whole time and like even some of the ghosts that i'm like all right this is this guy that we actually saw buy our drinks or whatever and i mean the entire movie like these guys were super creeps they were like pieces of shit and i yeah i just found it was weird that there then it's like this twist like oh well you know she she murdered me like so you need to help us and but i was kind of like well this whole movie's kind of told us that realistically we shouldn't care these guys were fucking terrible well well that's the thing that's the thing too where i i wound up saying like well were they completely terrible the entire time which i never want to defend like that that sort of people <laughs> but it winds up being like I could completely get on board with her, like, killing her her pimp, you know, killing Matt Smith. I can completely get on board with her killing any men that were, like, physically uh, abusive or, like, not paying her or stuff like that. But there was a point in the movie where, like, she was using all these different names and, like, you know, kind of, like, taking some amount of... I wouldn't say pleasure in it, obviously, but like she she was like treating it as a job. And that was kind of like when I was watching it, I wasn't sure. Like, I wasn't sure if I like misunderstood something the entire time, like because obviously like she was getting paid for it and dressing nice and whatnot, like after the fact, like as a, you know, with her fashion and whatnot. But obviously, like I'm sympathetic towards the Sandy character the entire movie. And then she winds up being like, I murdered hundreds of people. And it winds up in my head. I go like, OK, like how do the scales of justice balance there 100 percent? Like it was just, I was, I was very weird. Plus, they also make her want to kill Thomas and Mackenzie. Yeah, and kill uh, our friend Michael Aujau, which uh, John in the movie. Like it's just like, like the character goes crazy, like off the deep end. And I don't know what we're supposed to feel by the end. Even like I think the last shot of the movie is her winking at Thomason in the mirror, right? Like winking yeah. or blowing her a kiss or something. Where I go like, okay, like obviously Thomason has a connection to this woman, but she's also a crazy like serial killer like to like you know literally like jack the ripper times 10 i don't know it's it's very weird i mean to me it's just kind of like we said like i i just really think the whole third act seemed like super rushed i feel like it definitely wasn't created at the same time as the rest of the film exactly that was my thing like i'm all good like super jollo that you know the twist of like her being the killer and all this. Oh yeah, I'm fine with that twist 100%, yeah. But like you said, exactly. It didn't make sense to me 
on the fact that, well, she she killed all these men, and yeah, then she's just like, all of a sudden, she's like, well, now I'm gonna kill, like, these innocent people, and yeah. it didn't make any sense, and then there was also, like, uh, the scene at the end when, you know, she, she comes up to the bedroom or whatever, and then, yeah. and then they reconcile, like, that was bizarre to me, I'm like, she literally 100%, just, yeah. just stabbed uh, the shit out of your boyfriend, and... And I was down for drugging you and stabbing you downstairs, but now that we're upstairs, now I want to be your friend again. Like, yeah, like, there's stuff that's set up there, obviously. Like, she mentions about, like, the bistro next door having a smell of garlic that hopefully, obviously in retrospect now like overpower the scent of bodies but like hundreds of bodies hidden in the floor uh the the phone upstairs only being an emergency line which makes sense because she used to use it you know she'd bring the the men upstairs yeah um so it makes sense and you know when thompson lifts it it's like okay she called for help it's an emergency line but it's just like i don't know man like there's so much of the third act that just falls apart for me and the fact that i can't get a clear what the movie was trying to say like are we supposed to sympathize with the men are we supposed to sympathize with Sandy? Are we supposed to be somewhere in the middle? Are we just supposed to be confused? Like, it literally kind of, like, pokes and prods at a bunch of different directions, and then I don't know where it lands, which obviously makes me feel like, well, you know, I don't know how to feel about the ending. Like, it just doesn't work for me. I want it to be clearer. One thing that I thought kind of got lost in the shuffle that I thought was, you know, pretty cool was throughout the movie, you know, we're kind of showing, like, the importance of, like, mirrors, you know, yeah. we use the mirrors so we know that, like, uh, that Sandy and, I guess, Thomas's name in the movie, Eloise. Eloise, okay, yeah. I couldn't remember it, because it's been a week, yeah. Like, that they're the, you know, they're one in the same in these mm-hmm. dreams. And, like, I, I thought it was cool, like, especially Especially um, where we get the scene where Sandy's like having the drinks with all the guy. Then Eloise is like kind of pounding on the glass. Yeah, trying to stop her. Yeah. And all this kind of stuff. And I guess I it was just, you know, I felt they didn't really explore that. Because I was like, all right, this is going to like at some point have something to do in the end. You know, I was like, they're going to somehow use like breaking through glass and stuff. And then I feel like they just kind of dropped it after that. Yeah, I also thought like uh Eloise was going to be more wrapped up in like Sandy and her were going to become one almost like yeah. honestly like I thought this movie was going to be about uh, a girl from a small town going to London and completely losing herself to like the seedy ud- underbelly of a city so like with all the like hinting at like the strip club or the girls club across the road and like the you know the signs in the telephone booth of like you know if you need money like give us a call like I thought she was going to wind up like in some s- form of sex work or something at some point in the movie too like and I wasn't sure if it was going to be like of her own accord or not because she was losing grasp on reality like completely like by the third act of this movie so i didn't really want to see the character do that but it also would have made more sense in terms of the parallels of both of them on similar trajectories and similar paths um so i was a bit confused about that also the mother plot line um completely dropped after like the first i don't know 20 minutes of the movie yeah (laughs) definitely like you're laughing. You probably never even thought about that now. You're like, yeah, the mother was built up in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Absolutely no point in the rest of the movie. Like, I get, like, I guess, the only, like, it was just kind of that she has this connection to, like, the <laughs> She dead. sees people. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Or, like, something like that. Um, Although, it's kind of funny because <laughs> all, all the issues with it, I also kind of appreciate it because I'm thinking about, like, when I go and I, like, I watch, like, Jollos from, like, the se- mm-hmm. 60s and 70s for the the first time and like half the time like half the shit doesn't make any sense so i i thought it was kind of funny while i was watching it because i'm like oh this shit that doesn't make sense it, it's just like me watching any just other. like a giallo yeah, yeah like, and that's just... what i saw some people saying as well and maybe i just need to watch more giallos because i don't know i had this issue with malignant as well but like this felt way more giallo to me than malignant like it kind of had the vibes of what i know is giallo to be where it's you know it's titillating there's there's murder, there's all these crazy colored lights, there's an aspect of, like, losing your sense of reality, like, this dreamlike quality to it. Oh, I was like, yeah, this feels like a giallo 100% when I was watching this. It definitely had that feel, I know 100% that I 
wish I lived in that lighting is just oh that's my lighting. Yeah, as, as soon as you saw that lighting like at the top where it was changing from like the red the blue to white or whatever going back and forth I was like all right yeah it's gonna be make for some cool sequences in this bedroom like we said like the most of this movie I think pulled off everything that needed to pull off I, I was like so on board like literally I was like this is like a five star like slay movie for me for like literally like an hour to an hour and 15 obviously I've only watched it once so I'm not sure when the ghosts first appear but when they first appeared in the bedroom i was like okay it's a bad effect if it's used sparingly i can look past it and this can still be like a masterpiece but it is used so bluntly like to hunt like literally dozens of cgi ghosts chasing them through like the streets of london and library that it gets way too goofy and poor thomas and mckenzie's there screaming her head off for the last 20 minutes of the movie non-stop and there's nobody around her that's like willing to help her that's why i was like that like uh i think his name is john in the movie michael aujau's character yeah. and it's kind of like i feel like he would have like wanted her to get help or i feel like the police would have wanted her to get help or like somebody like the fact that like she's clearly having like a psychotic break at the end of this movie and everyone's just like standing around gawking you know it's just it's weird anytime i saw the ghosts for some reason all i thought about was uh the frighteners i was like this seeing it i was like that's what the effect reminded me of i was like i was like where's michael j fox like what's going on here yeah but like when did the frighteners come out right like well, and that, is, <laughs> that's the this same. is 2021 like yeah it, and and edgar wright a dude who's all about like style and camera movement and like cool editing you know it's just like i know he could have came up with a better way to do this than just like shitty cgi ghosts it, it's it's so sloppy for the rest of the movie which like i said two-thirds of this movie is like from what i remember like perfectly done so it, it's so weird <laughs> hey are you interested in becoming a horror hound then join us at www.patreon.com slash podcast. And uh, check out everything we have to offer. We have uh, cool things from podcast shoutouts to picking movies all the way to uh, maybe getting yourself a free t-shirt. So uh, if you're interested in joining us and becoming a horror hound, join us at patreon.com slash podcast. <laughs> Well, uh, do we want to get into our preliminary ratings here? Yes, sure. Why not? The, the thing is, is, like, I feel bad because all we did really is kind of talk about the ending of the movie when the rest of the movie honestly is so good. But it's like there's not a whole lot to say about it because it's so much like the style and like going along with Eloise, like as she kind of like sees, you know, 60s London, falls in love with it and then, you know, becomes yeah. afraid of it, essentially. It, it's just very much like there's not a whole lot in terms of like actual plot and like narrative happening in those sequences. It's just like he does a great job of like sweeping you up and putting you in like the same headspace as Eloise as well, where it's like, oh, yeah, this looks awesome. And then by the end, it's like, oh, this looks grungy and dirty and, you know, harrowing to some degree. I'll let you start off what you think. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, like like I said before, two thirds of this movie is a slay. Um, the last third is a hard nay. So overall, like I wound up giving it like a very, very, very soft yay. It, it's like right on the precipice of going to okay, almost purely based on that ghost effect and my like overall like confusion slash how rushed that third act, how certain plot points were dropped, like the mother and stuff. And that really, really like cheesy, like last minute or two of the movie with the fashion show sequence. That's so cheesy. So I don't know. Very, very soft. Yay for me on a rewatch. It might be an okay or. I don't know, maybe I'll love it on a rewatch. I have no clue. Yeah, so I'll give it a hard yay. Okay. I really had to talk, when I was done, even with the third act, when I came out of the theater, I had to talk myself down from being like, this is a, like a total slay. This was everything that I love. This is like, I was like, this is an actual modern day Jalo. Like, this is absolutely fantastic. It does fall apart in the third act, but enough of this movie was good enough that I was like, oh, I'll probably watch this. Like, this will all buy, I'll buy this when it comes out, like, immediately. And I will watch this, like, many times again. I'll definitely be giving it a rewatch for sure when it comes out. And I don't know. It's just for me, like, I just really wish he used the practical effects. Like, even that staircase 
face at the end when yeah. Anya Taylor Joy's climbing up the staircase with a knife in her hand. It's all like wobbly, all bad CGI. It's like, dude, just put a staircase there. Use a camera like angle. It would have been so cool. Like, I don't know. I was going to say, if there's any reason for anyone that ne- well, that needs a reason to watch it, all you need is kind of the, the climax scene of when we get the freak out in the bedroom when she's like first seeing Sandy murdered. Yeah. And, and he does like the classic 70s giallo where you see the knife and then you see Eloise's reflection. face. Yeah. And I, I lost it. I was like, oh, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. 100% in right up until like probably about five minutes after that sequence, <laughs> you know, like. I was like, my price of admission was worth it for that scene alone. For sure, yeah. So, yeah, like yeah. I said, I, I'll give it a strong Strongye. I think if you really like Jollos, that this should make you pretty happy, especially if you weren't happy with uh, Malignant. Yeah, and if you're a huge fan of, like, Edgar Wright, you probably already saw this anyways, but I would say, like, you know... it doesn't feel like a traditional Edgar Wright movie in a lot of regards, probably just literally because of the genre, but there's yeah. still a lot of his trappings in there. Obviously the love for music, the quick cuts, you know, and uh, a lot of DNA with baby driver, I think too. So I guess we don't want to go on too long about it. I feel this, no, no, no. I feel like this will definitely be a pick at some point that everyone's going to jump on. So I feel like Mike would probably love this movie. Oh, just... the, the entire time yeah. I was watching it, I was like, Oh, Mike just needs to go watch this. So I, can talk 100%. About it. Yeah. There, there's lots of women that he loves in it. So I got you. Yeah. So I guess that's everything. Uh, yeah. This will be out it's Friday night, November 5th. So I'll probably have this out tonight. Awesome. All right. All right. So uh, yeah, this is Rowan. We will see you later. And this is Colton. See ya. Bye. We're going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store. Back where it says horror videos and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing inquiring minds want to know? I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick encrustations dying on the surface. But the prime time gets. Not with the new flesh. The pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. I've got to return some video games.